Hello, everyone. Oh my god. Hello. Damn it. I can do this. I can, I can do this. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Daria. Welcome back to my channel. And today, today, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends, I'm going to be embarking on a journey that I have waited over two years to start. For those of you who are unaware, the greatest Grishaverse book that Lee Bardugo has ever written was published nearly two years ago in 2019, entitled King of Scars. I reread King of Scars in preparation for this video and also because I was starting to doubt myself. I remember loving King of Scars when it first came out, so I was a little bit nervous that going into it this time around I would notice some of the flaws. But you know what? There are none. It suits my reading tastes perfectly. It's a character study. It's about political intrigue and slow burning plots. We are looking at a country trying to stabilize itself after years and years of suffering and war. We are looking at three of the greatest and the most complex Grishaverse characters that have ever existed, Nikolai, Zoya, and Nina. And to top it all off, we've got the greatest Grishaverse ship of all time, Nikolai and Zoya. And one of the reasons that I'm really looking forward to reading Rule of Wolves is to see my end game realized. I'm not sure how many of you follow me on Goodreads, but on January 30th of 2019, I marked Rule of Wolves to be read, and my review was as follows. I will be coming to collect my Zoyali endgame this time around. Bow down to the King of Scars and the Queen of Storms. I truly just can't express to you how excited and terrified I am to read this book. On these pages is some of the last Grishaverse content that we are going to be getting for a while now. I know Lee has spoken about a third Six of Crows book, but she has not given us a timeline. I think it's sort of in the back of her mind just sort of brewing, but we're probably not going to see it for a while. So this is kind of where she's bookmarking the series a bit. It's where she's leaving us until she decides that she wants to return. So before we go any further, I want to let you guys know that this video is going to be full of spoilers. But not to worry, there is something here for you spoilers free loving folks as well. I have timestamps marked down below so if you want to skip ahead and see my spoiler free review of Rule of Wolves you can go ahead and do that now and hopefully you'll come back once you've read the book. Alright, so I'm about a hundred pages in so far and a lot has happened. So basically the Fjordans declared war and they had their first battle with the Ravkins, but luckily the Zemini showed up. So the Zemini and the Ravkins are like teaming up against the Fjordans and Zoya had a meeting with a Kirch representative and basically the Kirch are like, we don't want any part of this. We want to remain neutral because we want to be able to trade with everybody and anybody. At the same time, Nina is in Fierda, and there is a Lansov pretender, or maybe not so much pretender. He's like a distant cousin and he wants the throne. And the Fierdans are supporting his claim, and also the Apparat. And I don't like that bitch. So if the Apparat likes this guy, I automatically don't like this guy. There have also been relationship developments. So there's a lot of jealousy coming from Nina because her and Hana have basically decided to enter into this like high society event where girls are basically trying to find husbands. And they're doing this so that they can be close to the Lansoff pretender and so they can follow Broom and all of the other commanders and figure out what their moves are going to be in the war with Ravka. And Nina is just constantly talking about how beautiful Hana is and how, you know, she feels really uncomfortable at the thought of Hana marrying anybody and sweetie, honey, baby, you got a crush. I don't know, the Fjordans just suck, man. Like they really do. Like they're so patriarchal. They are basically using Grisha as vessels of war. Like am I supposed to like these bitches? Because I don't and I honestly wouldn't care if Ravka got rid of them. And there have also been updates on the Zoya life front. So Nikolai was trying to save Princess Ari from being burned to death by the Tavgarad and he got like really bad burns on his arms. So he's getting healed for those injuries and the entire time he's just like, where's my general? Where's my general? In his like half conscious state of mind, he's asking for Zoya not to leave and Zoya tells him while he's asleep that she would try to stay. If she could, she would want to stay forever. Like shut the fuck up. 
when there are declarations of feelings when the other person is asleep or can't hear. Like that's my shit. So before I get back into reading, there is one super exciting thing, or should I say two super exciting things that I want to show you guys that just came in the mail. There's a very popular Instagram account slash update account for the Shadow and Bone Netflix show that I follow, and they are currently hosting an art campaign to raise money for BLM and Stop Asian Hate. All the artwork was gorgeous. It's for a great cause. I highly recommend that you guys check it out. If the campaign is still going on, I will link it down below. And my fan art just arrived in the mail, so I thought I would show it to you guys. I got two pieces of art. The first, which you kind of already saw, is of Jenya. I love Jenya so much. I feel like I don't talk about her as much as I do Zoya or Nikolai, but she really holds a special place in my heart. And the second piece of artwork that I got is this Zoyalai fan art. This is like my favorite Zoyalai fan art I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot, okay? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay, we need to talk because developments are happening so quickly that I cannot wrap my head around right now. So Nikolai and Zoya went to go visit the Darkling who is currently occupying Yuri's body, the name of that monk who like believed in him and worshiped him and whatever. He's telling Nikolai and Zoya that they can get the demon, which is basically a manifestation of the Darkling's power out of Nikolai, but who wants something in return. And what does this, what? What does he want? Go ahead and guess, like what do you think this man, out of everything he could ask for, what does he ask for? Freaking Alina Starkov, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? Oh my God. I swear to God, if she makes an appearance in this book, I, I swear. He literally says that he wants a chance to see what became of the girl who drove a knife into my heart. I am sweating at the mere mention of Alina Starkov. Can you imagine how I'm gonna be if she shows up if there's a Dark Lena reunion. Oh my God. You know what else this means though? Is that Mal is probably gonna come back because I'm assuming him and Alina, like they ran off together, right? So he would come back if Alina came back. I, I honestly don't know how I'm gonna feel about that. I'm currently rereading Shadow and Bone the book in preparation for the show. And so far my feelings on Mal have not changed. He's annoying. I don't know how I'm gonna feel if he shows up again in this book. I really don't. I know I mentioned before that this is like the last book that Lee is going to be writing in the Grishaverse for what seems like a while now. So what if her plan is to like bring everyone back for like a final goodbye? She has Nikolai and Zoya. She's bringing back Alina, apparently. All these main characters from the trilogy. And you know what else? Oh my God, oh my God. Power thought. Nina has been mentioning Kaz and Jesper and the Crows so often in this book. Like obviously she has history with them. In King of Scars, she did mention them here and there, but like in the first hundred pages of this book, she has mentioned them nearly every other page. And there's already a setup with like the Kirch people not wanting to be part of the war. So like, are my crow babies coming back? What if that's what she's doing? What if she's bringing all the characters back for like this final showdown against the Darkling? I'm literally gonna, I'm gonna, oh my God. Oh my God. She's back. Alina Starkov, light of my life, the meaning for my existence, she is back. So Zoya set up a meeting between Alina and the Darkling and Mal was also there, but you know, whatever, we're just gonna ignore that. The conversation that Alina and the Darkling had, the conversation that all the characters were having about their past and how Alina and Zoya used to believe in the Darkling and while they still stand by the reason for his actions, wanting to protect the Grisha, the way he did it was just absolutely unacceptable and horrifying. And there's still this struggle within Alina in particular to want to see some good in him because they followed him, because they believed in him. And the Darkling is constantly coming at Alina saying that, you know, you could have had this incredible life filled with so much power, you could have ruled a nation, and now you live in obscurity. And what's so interesting about that conversation and what I personally feel like might be happening in this book is Lee is almost responding to a lot of fan criticism. A lot of people were not a fan of how the Grisha trilogy ended. They were not a fan of Lena giving up her powers. They were not a fan of her running off with Mal. And I was definitely one of those people. And the Darkling is just loved by so many fans. He is such an incredible villain. I definitely enjoy him and I'm very happy to have him back. And I know that logically the Darkling is the villain. Ultimately, the goal is for him to be defeated. You know, we're meant to root for Alina and for what she wants. And according to her, 
she's very happy just living her life with Mal. But you know, there is that part of me that would have liked to have seen Alina sort of embrace her powers, go to the dark side. I would have liked to have seen it. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. Also, oh my gosh, just an absolutely iconic moment where Nikolai invited Queen Makai, who is like the queen of the shoe, he invites her to attend his wedding. And I did air quotes because it turns out it's not even his wedding. He had this whole plan. He basically invited the queen under the pretense that it was going to be his wedding, but it is actually an official ceremony for David and Janya and their marriage, which was just, side note, so adorable. I love those two with every fiber of my being. They're just so sweet together. Like, they're that side couple that every time they come on the page, it's like a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Who's gonna tell her? Who's gonna tell her? So the plan was Nikolai sends Princess Ari back to Shuhan. She tells everybody about the attempted assassination. And now Queen Makai is basically forced into a treaty and an agreement with Raka. I just love this kind of political intrigue and machinations. Like this is what I live for in books. Like I don't care about the big battles and the wars. Like I just want smart, clever, cunning people doing smart, clever, cunning people things. Oh, that's a joke. Oh, that's literally a joke. That's not. David's missing. David's missing and we're literally about to go into the next part of the book, the making it the heart of the world. I, where's David? Where's David? Who is responsible for this? Who is responsible for this mess, okay? The Fjordans, the shoe, I don't care. I want them dead. sick. I, I, don't, I literally have nothing to say. This is just, this is a fucking joke. David Caustic returns to the making at the heart of the world. He will always be with us. As he returns, so will we all. Are you kidding me? Are you j I, <laughs> I have to laugh because if I don't, I'll cry. Janya is literally putting, oh my god, she's putting David's book that has ideas for compliments and thinks he was gonna say to her to compliment her to show how much he loved her of everyone like of everyone it had to be David like he's just he was he was so good Jenya Safin does not deserve this I am rereading the Grisha trilogy right now and the way that people treated her the abuse that she suffered everything that she went through she finally gets this like sliver of happiness and it just gets taken away again? Are you fucking kidding me? I've got- I've moved past sadness. I'm angry. I'm like- like- I'm angry. <gasps> oh my god. Shut the fuck up. They're going to Ketterdam. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Oh my god. Okay, I need to go. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> when I said that I thought the whole gang was gonna show up in this book, that was like 50%, no, 60% a joke, okay? I literally, like, if we get Jesper and Nikolai interactions, shut up. Shut up. This book is taking me on such epic highs and lows. Literally, I was crying my eyes out five minutes ago, and now I, I have to pace. I can't do anything other than pace. Okay, so all the updates I've given you have been more like character focused. So now I want to talk about the plot and how much I'm loving it. So we're following a lot of characters this time around. We are also following Alexander, AKA Darkles, and it's incredible to be inside this man's head. He basically wants to stage this very elaborate comeback, if you will and he wants to position himself as a saint who is going to save Ravka. He wants to be adored. That's what he's always wanted. At the same time, we also have Nina's plot, which is starting to get very interesting to me. Nina's whole thing that she's doing right now, which I absolutely, I just think it's genius, is that she's trying to turn the feared and people against their government, particularly Jarl Broom. Obviously, the Fjordans have always believed in killing Grisha, and the only way to sort of counteract that hatred is 
for Nina to sort of maybe convince this entire country that the Grisha are actually the children of their god Jell. So she and all of the- so she and all these Grisha are like faking these miracles and she's kind of like planting ideas in the Queen's mind, in the Druskala's mind, that maybe these Grisha are actually the children of Jell and thus they should be worshipped and praised instead of hunted and killed. This is like the shit that I love. I don't like outright battles. I like this kind kind of conniving, insidious, sort of getting into your mind and changing your psychology and using that in a fight. That's just so interesting. I just, I love this. Also, when it was revealed that Joran is a follower and believer in Alina Starkov, genius. That boy's mind, just wow. I don't know that woman. I, I don't know her. Okay, so I said I was gonna focus on plot stuff, but also I just, I need to say there have been so many like angsty mutual pining moments between Zoya and Nikolai. I can't stand it. Like I love it, but at the same time it kills me. That's the thing about mutual pining, that is why it hits every single time because you as the reader have more information than the characters. You know how they feel about each other, you know that they both want to be together, but then you are also aware of the reasons they can't and how both of them think that the other person doesn't want to be with them, but then you know that they do. And the great thing about Zoya and Nikolai and their mutual pining, it's actually rooted in real external things. Nikolai needs to make a politically advantageous marriage. I'm literally so stressed out right now. I'm talking so fast I'm barely breathing in between my sentences. And I'm about to start the chapter in which Nikolai and the rest of the crew show up in Ketterdam. I literally, I f I'm gonna go feral. I'm letting you know right now. Like you think that you've seen some shit in this vlog so far? You haven't seen anything. Zoya Nazielenski calling Kaz Brecker a barrel rat. Things I never even thought I wanted and yet absolutely needed. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, I have to read this. Because they love a good thrill, said a voice behind them. The old beggar had followed them down the stave, but now he stood unfolding from his bent posture and cast off his foul-smelling cloak along with the gray wisps of what must have been a wig. This bitch! I can't stand him. The walking stick in his hand was topped by a crow's head. Kaz Brecker, oh, it feels so good to say that, wiped the putty from his face and ran a gloved hand through his dark hair. Didn't you know, General Nazielenski, thrills are what all these pigeons come to the barrel for. I am literally gonna spend the rest of this book giving you guys page by page updates because so much is happening and I'm feeling so many things. Nikolai literally just mentioned Inej. He said the wraith and Kaz literally lost his footing. Like, is that a joke? Do I look like a joke to you? Watching Nikolai and Kaz like verbally spar with one another, I I feel giddy. I just, I love everything about this. Like I'm having so much fun. It's that feeling of wanting to like rush to the end of the book and just find out what happens. You're dying to know, but at the same time, you kind of want to just savor it because you'll never be able to read this again for the first time. I'm just, I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm feeling real good. So as a woman of my word, I said I'd be giving you page by page updates and that's exactly what I'm doing because guess who just showed up? My best boys, Jesper and Wylan. And literally the first conversation that they have with Kaz, my heart is so full. Like if you're watching this right now, you've already read this part, but I'm gonna read it to you again because it's just, it's that iconic. I'm not supposed to let you in, Jesper said. Brecker seemed unperturbed. Why not? Because every time I do, you ask me to break the law. A voice from behind Jesper said, the problem isn't that he asks, it's that you always say yes. I don't know better people. I've never met better people in my life. What is inside Lee Bardugo's mind to come up with this shit? The way that she just absolutely crushed me with what happened with David only to raise me up to the heavens with this featuring of the crows. Like if Inez shows up, it's, it's done. It's over. It's over for me. I'm literally not gonna survive this book. I'm not. Like this This entire vlog is just me hyping myself up to read this book because I, f I physically feel like I can't do it. I have to like keep stopping and I get up and I like go to the bathroom or I go to the kitchen and grab something that I don't even need because I, I physically, I, like I can't sit still. And the thing is, it's like, I feel like I should be like running around and screaming at someone like, oh my God, like this is happening, but like no one cares. <laughs> this is just me sitting in my house and no one gives a fuck. No one gives a fuck. <laughs> it's just me. I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm doing it again. <laughs> Literally all Kaz had to say was, we're doing this for Inej. And it was like, immediate. Wylan's like, what do you need? The found family trope has never 
been so well executed until Six of Crows. I stand, I am at once elated and devastated. This man really sat there and said, I would choose you as my queen. I want you. Nothing in the world could stop me from wanting you. Are you serious? That's, that's sick. That's sick and twisted. It was like a love confession. It was a fucking, like, that was a proposal. And she had to turn him down because of all this, like, stupid political expectations. Like, I, I hate it out here. I hate it out here. I swear to God if she is not the first Grisha queen. I mean, I got what I wanted, didn't I? What's so funny to me is I heard about King of Scars and I knew next to nothing about it because at the time I hadn't read the Grisha trilogy. I knew that Nina was getting a POV, which is why I was desperate to read it. And then I also knew that Nikolai and Zoya would have POVs and be main characters as well. So when I was reading the Grisha trilogy, I had my eye out for Zoya and Nikolai. And from the moment I met those characters, I thought they have potential as a couple. I thought that there was something there, that there could be something there. So I feel like in a way, my crack ship has almost come to life. Zoya and Nikolai together, like just the fact that they're two insanely gorgeous people automatically made me want them to be together. I'm vain, I'm shallow, I'm willing to admit that. But also, and I've said this before, Zoya and Nikolai are the kinds of characters that they present themselves as one thing when in fact they really are another. When we meet Nikolai, he oozes charm, he's very brash, he's dashing. But that is largely a performance and we figure that out in King of Scars that he learned to be that way in order to get what he wants from people. And when we meet Zoya, she's just a cocky, beautiful Grisha girl. And then we learn the reasons why she joined the Grisha, why she followed the Darkling, why she is the way she is, why she has that cold exterior. You basically have two people who in their own ways don't really allow anyone to see their true self, but they show that true self to each other. I love it. I love them. Like honest to God, Zoya Lai is the best Grishaverse ship along with Jenny and David. I don't want to talk about it. I'm the the wound is raw. So I have less than 100 pages left in the book and I just read through all the chapters that encompassed the grand finale battle that just went down. And I'm having some thoughts now that I'm nearing the end of the book and after this battle. And those thoughts mainly consist of the fact that I was really intrigued by so many of the plots that were going on in this book. But at the same time, I feel like it was a detriment to have so many. We've got the shoe storyline with Mayu and the Care Good. We've got Nikolai and Zoya going to Ketterdam and meeting up with the crows. We've got Nina trying to convince the Fjerdins that the Grisha are saints and at the same time, she and Hana are trying to romance and influence the prince. And of course we have the romances between Zoyalai and Hana and Nina. I don't know what their ship name is. Hina? I'm gonna go with Hina. And then Zoya had this just absolutely incredible, stunning moment where she opened herself up to the world basically, like Juris encouraged her to do in King of Scars and became the dragon. We've also got the Darkling being back and wanting to position himself as the savior of Ravka. And instead of doing that, he basically calls Zoya a saint. I have no idea what the fuck he's planning there. And then there's the fact that Nikolai is a bastard and that's looming over his head and there's another Lansov trying to take his crown. He manages to randomly have an audience with his father who managed to break out of the feared in prison to see his son. I don't know if we're ever gonna hear from him again. It's just a lot. I am enjoying myself immensely, don't get me wrong. I am eating this shit up, I am having so much fun, but my critical eye is looking at this book and thinking that it is not as tightly structured and well plotted as previous books that Lee has written. So those are my thoughts at the moment as I am heading in to the final chapters of this book. I am not sure what is left for them to do. We are about to go into truce talks and negotiation with the Fjordans and the Ravkins and Nikolai's parentage and the fact that he's a demon is probably going to be some strikes against him keeping the throne. What the fuck is happening? Hana's dead. I knew that something was gonna happen, but she's just, she's dead? Yo, what the fuck? 
what is it with Lee Bardugo and killing all of Nina's feared and love interests? What is happening? Honestly, I feel like I'm more shocked than I was when David died. Like when David died, I was sad, but now I'm just like so thrown of everything that has happened in this book. The Darkling coming back, the crow showing up, David's death, of everything, I was not fucking expecting that. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Shut up. Shut up. Okay. I, I feel like I need to like talk to you guys as I'm reading this. Nikolai, this bitch. I have never loved a man more in my entire life. He suggested that Zoya should be queen and now she's going around saying, will you have a soldier queen? Will you have a Rothkin queen? Will you have a Sully queen? And all these people are like stepping up and saying, yes, yes, we will. We will have you as our queen. I'm gonna cry. It's what my girl deserves. It's what she fucking deserves. And now the fucking Darkling is showing up. I swear, I'm telling you, he has a plan. Oh, fucking pillow. He has a plan in his mind that he's gonna like use Zoya on his side to try to like curry her favor or somehow, I don't know, like use her new status in his favor to like gain back sympathy from the people. Like, I don't know, but he has a plan. Maybe I should stop speculating and actually read it and then I'll find out. I won. I put in the work. I put in the hours of romanticizing and fantasizing about Zoya and Nikolai as queen and king of Ravka. And I got it. And I didn't just get it in the way that I thought I would get it. No, I get Zoya Nazielenski as the ruler of Ravka with Nikolai as her toy boy on the side or her husband, whatever. Just incredible. Oh my God, incredible. You know what this means, right? Nikolai gets to go on all his little adventures and go off and do what he wants. And then Zoya's just gonna be there like a fucking badass, like taking care of business. It's too perfect. Like I didn't even, I didn't even think about it. I didn't even think about the possibility of this. And now it's here and it's, it's perfect. Now I can call Zoya Nazielinski a fucking queen and it'll just be an entirely accurate statement. She's a queen. She's a fucking queen, man. Oh my God. Ugh, the Zoyli banter, I literally can't stand it. Like, I can't stand them. Just listen to this. You do realize you just referred to yourself as the queen. That means you agreed. I am going to kill you. So long as you kiss me again before you do, she obliged him. I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to talk about it. Also, I just, I want to say this right now. I'm going into a Nina chapter and Prince Rasmus was acting super weird in the negotiations. Honestly, there's like this thing in the back of my mind. I'm thinking that Hannah actually isn't dead and that she tailored herself to look like Rasmus because he's just, he's acting weird. So I, I think, I think, I don't know. I'll let you know if I'm right. Honestly, I probably won't be. I always stop myself from making predictions and having theories when it comes to books because they're always wrong and I always look like a dumbass. I was right. Lee Bardugo needs to stop. I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> it's literally like the last five pages. And who shows up? My best girl, Inej. Oh my God, do you know what this means? It means that I have two best Suli girls, Inej and Zoya. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Yeah, okay, Um. I'll be back. I know I've been reading so many lines, but let me just read this to you. Just listen to this and tell me if you've heard a more iconic line. Tell Kaz Brecker, the queen of Ravka has a job for him. You know what? Actually scratch what I just said before. You can't tell me that there's a more iconic last line than that. Wow. So many thoughts, so many thoughts. First, let's talk about the fact that the Darkling sacrificed himself to basically save Ravka. I like that it wasn't an entirely selfless act because that's not who the Darkling is. He wants to save Ravka, but more than that, he wants to save them because he wants their love. He wants their adoration. And it is hinted to at the end of the book in that final chapter that the Darkling isn't going to stay in between the worlds for long. The ending to this book is very open-ended, extremely open-ended. There are very tentative alliances between the Shu and the Ravkins. We have no idea how people are going to react to Zoya being the queen. Like I just mentioned, we've got the whole issue with the Darkling. They want to try to find the heart of Sankt Felix, I believe. And they want to use that as a replacement for the Darkling and just like get rid of him for good. And of course, to find this long lost relic, she's gonna need some very specific help from some very specific people. A lot of the plots in this book 
feel unfinished because obviously Lee is going to be leaving room open to continue with the series. Like we all know there's going to be a Six of Crows 3 and I think we've all gotten a hint of what that plot and what that heist is gonna be. This book was very ambitious on Lee's part. She was trying to involve so many different countries and characters and storylines and because there were so many storylines I do believe that certain conveniences were taken, some things wrapped up too quickly or were accomplished a bit too easily in my opinion. But I'm not mad at where things ended up. I enjoyed this book immensely. Did I enjoy it as much as King of Scars? I don't know, that remains to be seen. I think right now I'm looking at a 4 or 4.5 star rating. Obviously this book pulled a lot of emotions out of me, but as I said before I think there were some structural issues and I believe that Maybe Lee was trying to do too much at once and some storylines definitely fell to the wayside or didn't feel as fleshed out as I thought they could be. I'm thinking particularly of the shoe storyline with Mayu and the Care Good. Everything with Nikolai's parentage and meeting up with his father again. Yeah, so there were little things here and there that I just felt weren't handled as I would have liked them to have been. Yeah, I would say all in all, this was worth the two year wait. I am satisfied. I'm feeling that sense of contentment and hint of sadness that I usually feel after I finish a really good book or the ending in a series and in this case I did both. So yeah, I'm feeling pretty damn good right now. So if you're watching this portion of the video I'm going to assume that either A you haven't read Rule of Wolves and you want to hear my non-spoilery thoughts on it or B you're just watching this video and now this non-spoilery section showed up. Either way let's talk non-spoilery rule of wolves things. So I feel like this doesn't need to be said but I'll say it anyway. If you have not read King of Scars this portion is still gonna be spoilery for you. Sorry. So we pick up right where we left off in King of Scars. The Darkling has returned. Nikolai is preparing to fight the Fjordans and he doesn't know if he can rely on the Shu, the Kerch, the Zemini, or really any other country for help. Zoya killed the Saint and Dragon Joris and thus consumed some of his powers and they attempted the Obispaya to get the demon out of Nikolai's body but instead it is just fused into him. So that is where we are and this book is all about the preparation before the war. Throughout the Grisha trilogy there is this running theme of magic versus machinery. In the Grisha trilogy we learn that guns have pretty much made magic almost obsolete and in Rule of Wolves we see a development of the machinery and of Grisha power. The Rothkins and the Fjordans are preparing for war and they are creating weapons of mass destruction basically. At the same time you have experiments being done on Grisha using Parem in both Fjorda and Shuhan. There's an escalation in tactics of warfare and thus a lot of this book is just Nikolai and everyone trying to stop this war from even happening because if it does there's no telling who will even survive, if anyone. So Nikolai and Zoya are preparing for war on the Rothkin border and then we have Nina who is still in Fierda. She's still disguising herself. She and Hana are trying to infiltrate the Fierdan monarchy. They are particularly trying to get close to the crown prince Rasmus and hopefully convince him that peace is a better option with Ravka. I mentioned in my review of King of Scars that it was a very character driven novel and that either works for people or it doesn't. The plot moved fairly slowly but I would have to say that Rule of Wolves definitely picks up the pace. There are a lot more fast moving plot elements but they are more so focused on political intrigue and sort of cunning and wiles more so than outright warfare and adventure. I'm not sure if I want to include this in the non-spoilery section but there are appearances made in this book by previous Grisha characters. That's all I'm gonna say. Do with that what you will. I would say that if you are invested in Nikolai and Zoya and their individual growth you're definitely going to love this book. We find out a lot more about Zoya and her past and we really get to see her open herself up. I'm trying so hard not to spoil things right now. Her journey where she ends up at the end of this book when you're comparing it to how we met her in the Grisha trilogy it is one of the most astounding and satisfying arcs in the entire Grishaverse. Nikolai also ends up in a completely surprising position at the end of this book and yet it makes perfect sense. The great thing about Lee and her characters is that they always end up in the complete opposite position that they started in and yet somehow it perfectly fits who they are as a character and as a person. There are a lot of loose ends in this book and I'm sure that was done purposefully because Lee has mentioned that she wants to come back and let me just say Six of Crows 3 is coming y'all and based on what I read 
it's gonna be good. Now obviously me as a reader I have a really great attachment to Zoya and Nikolai so I think no matter what this book was I was going to love it. But I can acknowledge that there were some structural elements to this book that didn't feel quite right to me. There were so many interesting storylines. We're following Nina and Fierda, we're following Zoya and Nikolai, we're following the Darkling at some point in this book. Nikolai is dealing with the demon, Zoya is dealing with Joris inside of her. We also have a storyline regarding the shoe and the line of succession in that country. There are so many A and B plots. It gets to be a little bit much and that is where this book kind of falters for me. All these characters, all these storylines were wonderfully intriguing but because there were so many of them not all of them felt as satisfying. I definitely felt that there were certain conveniences in this book, storylines that just wrapped up way too easily and too quickly, problems that seemed to resolve themselves off the page. I'm not mad at where any of these characters end up, but I wish we could have slowed down and taken our time a bit more getting there. So that is it for me today, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below. Let me know if you've read Rule of Wolves and what you thought of all the shit that went down. I don't think I've even fully processed it yet. If you want to find me or follow me anywhere else on social media, all the links will be down below. I love you all very dearly and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye!